You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe, how to plant a food forest, restorative design, or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. I'm sitting here with Christopher Shine, author of The Vegetable Gardener's Guide to Permaculture, Creating an Edible Ecosystem. And your book was fantastic. It was very user-friendly. It explained many things that I found a little confusing in the past. So thank you so much for joining me here for this podcast today. All right. Thanks for having me. I was reading your bio, and it sound, you do have roots in both gardening and social activism. And it sounds like your grandparents, you said, were radicals, which I love. Um, can you tell us how you blended the two of gardening and activism in your own life? Thanks. Yeah. So my grandparents in Detroit, Michigan, I grew up in Ann Arbor outside of Detroit, uh, where my grandfather, Saul Wellman, was a union activist and head of the Michigan Communist Party and went underground during the 19. 19- Um, 50s and all that during the Red Scare, McCarthyism and all that. So we have a healthy distrust of the government and my family Um, and um, just being rooted in the community. And um, he's famous for saying um, that he he was always fighting for a a level playing field was kind of boiled down his work. And a movie was actually made about him called Professional Revolutionary. And then my grandmother, um, Peggy Wellman, um, was also an interesting character and was a union organizer her whole life with the, uh, as a uh, union waitress with the hotel and restaurant employees union and a business agent for them. So she was a, a very tough business fighter for a uh, business agent for the, the union. Um, so, and she was a gourmet chef and she grew tomatoes So <laughs> in Detroit. So that's, she passed on when I was only three years old, but um, she did pass on of love of plants and social justice. So mm. that's part of it. Your book is about permaculture design and gardening. Would you say that permaculture can be a type of activism? Uh, yeah, in the right context. You know, there's a couple of important ethics in permaculture, earth care, people care, and fair share. Um, and I've heard recently from an African um, colleague that um, permaculture, the, the third ethic of fair share is future care. So I think that's really important, reframing that I didn't get that in the book because I only heard about it more recently. But yeah, I think a lot of the permaculture... Uh, gardening techniques can be just that of, you know, sheet mulching or polyculture gardening. And that's not so much social justice. That's just a gardening technique. So it, it can be just um, a specific technique of, of whatever. I think permaculture with the fair share of future care ethic really puts it different, makes it um, a different form than um, just a regular kind of organic gardening method. So a lot of people that come out of a PDC do it in a low-income neighborhood community garden or a school garden or figure out some kind of social enterprise that's really unique. And so sometimes permaculture can be about social activism. I don't think just permaculture itself is about social activism. In your summers in college, I read this in your bio, that you worked at a at Detroit Summer, and I don't know exactly what that is. Maybe you could tell us, mm-hmm. building community gardens. Can you tell us about that? And is that when you first started bringing food and gardening to the public at large? Yeah, that's really where I got um, excited about permaculture in Detroit, of all places, a post-industrial city. Um, I forget the exact numbers, but when I was there in uh, 1992, the first time I did it for four summers in a row, Detroit Summer, um, there was something like um, 65,000 vacant lots and 30,000 vacant homes, and it, it's a real post-industrial city. And I was lucky enough to be there in the, the first summer. I got an email from my mom, one of the very first emails even, as a college student saying, come to Detroit for a month and do community gardening and do um, community m- murals and do water quality monitoring and do house repair for seniors and just all these different social justice things. And so... When I was there that summer, I worked with a lot of the very young neighborhood kids in East Detroit, a very low-income neighborhood. Some of the neighbors in Detroit had, and probably still do, um, 92% unemployment. And, you know, so we were doing gardens in in those kind of neighborhoods and starting market gardens and hospitals and community gardens over the years because I did it for four years in a row. Because it was such a beautiful thing. And I even wrote my senior thesis as a college student about Detroit Summer because I was so inspired by it. And then um, after doing Detroit Summer, I went to Oakland, California, 
when I was uh, when I graduated in '93 from UC Santa Cruz, um, and I set up community gardens for the next three years as a volunteer thing because I was so um, juiced and jazzed by the Detroit summer energy. And it, it is amazing looking at your bio of all the things that you've accomplished. So you started Basil, is that how you say it? Basil was a seed library. Mm -hmm. And then you also um, are teaching a PDC at a college. We'll mm -hmm. get more into that later. And um, maybe share with us a bit about what you're doing right now, and then we'll get kind of more into the nuts and bolts of permaculture gardening. Yeah, so right now I'm teaching three PDCs a year through Merritt College, a community college in Oakland, California. Interestingly, where the Black Panthers, Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton came out of, the same college. And since then, um, since the 60s, it's Merritt is not in the Oakland Flats, it's up in the hills. But it's to our advantage at some level because we have um, many, many acres to work with. And our food forest is 11 years old and we have uh, one acre and... Some student pointed out there must have been 800 students who've taken the class so far because um, it's offered a lot and it's very affordable. So that's been a really great thing. And that's only something I do part time. I wish I did it more, but it's just the way the community college funding works and, um, and the support. So I, I'm there one day a week and we run a whole acre on a lot of volunteers, basically, and a lot of good energy with 300 species and varieties up there. So it's an incredible diverse garden. We're always um, further diversifying it and experimenting with new stuff pushing the edge, so to say. So that's one thing I'm doing. And you know, I've written this book is another thing I've managed to do somehow. Um, I have two daughters. That's really a big thing I do. And I do my own edible and native landscape design company. I do some rainwater and gray water with it. And um, I'm actually thinking now of turning it into a cooperative. I've done it for a long time as a solo enterprise, and I'm spread too thin. I can't do it myself anymore. So I've got quite a few former students and interns and friends that are in the same field and um, want to see it grow and get a bunch of people some employment. I was reading in your book that you've created more than 100 gardens, permaculture gardens. I'm sure it's probably more than that. Um, can you share with us what differentiates a permaculture garden from a, quote, regular garden? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so some of the gardens are just in the context of where they are, so it could be at an elementary school or some kind of public school, so that could be a food garden in, in the context of getting young people involved, but it turns more into a permaculture garden because we have a big emphasis on perennials, we do a lot of mulching, we really try to harvest the rainwater and recycle gray water back into the gardens, we build food forests, so it does get different in that sense that um, we try to integrate our gardens instead of segregate our gardens, so there's not usually a native garden separate unless it's for education purposes, um, and there's not an ornamental flower garden separate, and there's not a, a fruit tree orchard that's separate and not a vegetable garden that's separate and the annuals are separate from the perennial vegetables which are separate and that's how most gardens are unfortunately these days where they're just um, they're one thing and so you know driving around on this book tour right now just seeing that there's miles and miles of just avocados or just citrus or just artichokes or something and it's uh, Bill Molson has a famous quote about monocultures that monocultures are maintained disorders I think that's a really good thing because it's very energy intensive um, like in I was driving through uh, Watsonville and uh, the fields are um, you know miles and miles long with thousands of immigrant labor um, har harvesting all these strawberries and those fields are leveled with a laser beam I mean they're that flat they're literally I did some research I you didn't see it but they're just Imper impossibly level because the earth is round and yet these flat these fields were so flat um, just for industrial ag to be as efficient as possible but it's not efficient it's costing the workers health they're almost no wages so that's costing um, society so those people have to go to the hospital and they have to go to get food stamps and whatever and they just you know they're living in substandard housing and have substandard education so that's costing our society let alone the damage to the environment so permaculture is about earth care people care fair share and so anything in our modern industrial um, con so-called conventional ag is is not meeting those standards and we should in permaculture we're trying to come up with um, some more sustainable language and uh, I have a beef, so, so to say, with conventional ag, because 100 years ago, maybe 150 years ago, organic was conventional, so they've just kind of co-opted our language, and so they're um, modern industrial agriculture. We have to be really clear about that, and it's all profit-based agriculture that's mining the soil and mining the human communities and 
impoverishing communities. And so we have the most inequality around land ownership and land tenure, and we need to have land reform. And um, I'd really like to see that with permaculture being a spearhead for that so we could have more equitable systems. And so we don't have miles and miles of one crop owned by a corporate family farm. Instead, we have um, hundreds of families and communities that are growing much smaller scale so we can really steward the land and create a lot more jobs. Because David Holmgren, one of the founders of permaculture, has a really good thing to say about in the near future, um, we need to get a lot more people back on the land. And you know, people like Vandana Shiva say that India has a lot to teach the rest of the world because there's still over 75, 70% of the population are farmers on the land. And here in this country, we have less than 1%. So we've got to get off the tractor, so to say. Um, and, and, and change the laws. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, land reform, I think, is a key thing that permaculture, just the earth care, people care, fair share. We need um, more people on stewarding land. Um, so I think that would be a positive thing that we could do. And middle-aged and old elders. Too. Everybody, everybody. <laughs> but just, just for careers, I'm just thinking about working with young people getting and getting them um, on organic gardens and on permaculture gardens so then they can steward it for longer term. And yes, we definitely need all ages. Um, that, that was the greatest thing about Detroit Summer is that it was an intergenerational, multicultural, grassroots movement to change Detroit from the ground up is how they, something like that is how they quoted it. So yes, it definitely is not just going to be young people that change the world. So in regular, quote, regular gardening, gardeners care for plants. And do you think it's accurate to say that in permaculture gardens, that gardeners tend or design for the relationships between plants and the influences of sectors on the property? Uh, definitely, that's a good lead in. I think uh, in permaculture, we think about mutually beneficial relationships as a nice little buzzword around in the permaculture circles. So um, yeah, it's not just about plant health, although it's certainly, you know, we, we want healthy plants. A, a tool that permaculture uses um, from organic gardening is that you have to take care of the soil. So that's definitely where a good organic garden and a permaculture garden comes in is um, putting a lot of energy towards crop rotation, um, towards compost building, towards cover crops, um, towards nitrogen fixing plants. So all these things to help with soil building and soil fertility management um, on a sustainable level. And then in permaculture, we do this other thing in our gardens and our designs and our farms is thinking about planting water. So that's a really different way to think about water because right now in our society, you can just turn on the tap and um, pay for it. And we want to think about how can we um, reconnect and um, how can we make our systems more sustainable. Tell us what planting water actually means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this would be um, in the beginning of a garden doing earthworks is what we call it, uh, digging swales, so an uncompacted trench dug on contour, and that's a mouthful. And so another way to think about that is a level trench on a hillside. Our slight, most, pretty much almost all sites have some sort of slope to them. Like I said earlier, the earth is round, so um, and the ground has many contours. And so what we do is, you know, if it's a bigger site, you can use a laser level and some higher tech stuff. But if it's a small site and your grassroots project and don't have a laser level kind of technology um, or GPS, people use all kinds of things to figure out what's level nowadays. And it's awesome. And we want to use that technology. That's a, a useful tool. But in my gardens at Merit and my uh, permaculture gardens through Wild Heart Gardens, um, I've just used simple A-frames, which are peasant technologies that have been around for a long time to help figure out what's level because with your naked eye you can't really see what's level because um, the ground undulates in several directions and it's rather difficult. Unless you're in a strawberry field. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. And you can also use a, a water level, a bunyip. So there's a few very simple techniques to figure out what is level or even just a carpenter's level. You can really just figure out um, that's harder on, on um, undulating ground. But still, there's a number of ways to figure out what's level. So that's one simple way for water harvesting. Cool. And so you're keeping the rain on site. Yeah, yeah. So to finish with the um, swale idea, the contours is that say, say you have a slight hillside um, and say there's a rain event is what they call it in the world. So it's raining for us common folks and most of the water is going to sheet flow off of that hillside. Some of it will percolate in, but because it's a hillside, gravity and water, it just goes to the easiest point. So it's going to just come, most of the moisture will come off that slope. And so by digging the contour, we're going to do this really amazing thing uh, with water of slowing it, spreading it and sinking it. Uh, some of our 
permaculture teachers like Brock Dolman likes to say that our larger society has done the opposite of um, paving it, polluting it, and piping it for water. So those are just some things to think about. How can we rehydrate the landscape? We do lots of mulching in our garden, so we create a living sponge. So every time it rains, the organic matter, the mycelium, just can hold on to that moisture. So there's other techniques. You can just put mulch down, straw mulch down, or wood chips down as a rainwater harvesting start as well. Which is actually, it's probably going to activate the microbes in the soil as well. Yeah, it'll bring back the living soil food web is what we're aiming for. So you've talked a bit about how in permaculture you would have more of a polyculture garden, not Mm -hmm. just the row of strawberries for miles. Mm -hmm. And you also talk about some permaculture basics of polyculture gardens, fruit tree guilds, and food forests. Can you say a few words about um, fruit tree guilds? Yeah, I think uh, fruit tree guilds are really the nicest way to introduce people to um, permaculture, polyculture kind of thinking. Um, So polyculture, just real briefly before I get into fruit tree guilds, is just kind of something that we think about um, in permaculture a lot because we're, you know, we want to highlight what's an alternative to monoculture. And so obviously polycultures are the alternative and they are rooted in indigenous practices, agricultural practices around the world for millennia, many millennia. And so that's what we're trying to learn from our indigenous elders, how they were growing food in a sustainable way. And they did not have long rows of strawberries for miles and whatever and have um, exploited labor. They were the labor. Um, Their brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles, everybody was um, doing the, the work. Um, and by having more diverse crops in a small space, you'll get less yield of that major crop. So you'd have less corn production in a field if you're growing corn, bean, and squash. But um, by having corn, bean, and squash, the Native American three sisters, uh, the squash is mulching the soil. The squash is keeping the moisture in the soil. Um, the squash is keeping you know the weeds down and just doing all this organic matter um, back to the soil kind of thing. So that's what you want. So you're growing corn, um, squash, and the beans are a nitrogen fixer that can grow up the corn as a trellis. So like that's ingenious. And so you get less corn outputs for that system, but they get beans and they get squash and they get less weeds and, and they get soil. healthy soil mm-hmm. and, and they get a lot more calories and you don't want to eat just corn because you'll get sick if you eat one thing of only one thing. And so um, they were onto something and they didn't you know, our Western simplification of everything, trying to understand indigenous peoples. They they had, you know, 156, I don't know what the number is, but, you know, 156 sisters. It's not just three sisters because they ate all the weeds as medicinals and you know, as food plants as well. So um, that's it's a much bigger thing than the three sisters, but that's that's what we simplified it down to. And so would um, the three sisters or the however many you said, the hundreds, mm-hmm. is that a guild? Um, in a sense, yeah, that's with annual plants. Um, in um, a fruit tree guild, to bring it back to your, your backyard or your front yard or your school garden or community garden, whatever scale you have, a fruit tree guild is a really nice idea that you start with a central element and that's a fruit tree or a nut tree. And usually you want to start with something that's deciduous so you have more light in the winter time and the, the late fall, early spring, so you can grow a few other crops in between. You can grow guilds with evergreen trees, but that's more complicated to start. You need more space. But for a very small space, very simple system, say you start with your apple tree or a pear tree as your central element in a fruit tree guild, and then the first layer we like to think about are the nitrogen fixers, because that's where we get our soil fertility from in, in one source. But anyway, so something like a fava bean could be an annual plant, or a lupin could be a perennial that most people might be familiar with. And um, so they, they take atmospheric nitrogen uh, through their bacteria and fix it into the soil. So And then they, the bacteria live off the plants and um, live off the water and the carbon and you know, sugars from the plants, and then the plants get the extra bacteria. And so it's really interesting in an evolutionary perspective that um, nitrogen-fixing plants are the first pioneer species that come into an ecosystem, and then other things can do a succession because they've enriched the soil. So th- they're essential, but it's also essential to have have a nitrogen fixer just in general because we don't need to um, bring in um, purchased synthetically made nitrogen because plants do need the green nitrogen to grow, but um, the plants can grow it themselves. And so anytime the plants can do the work for us, we're doing much better. So that's kind of one of these things of permaculture we think about work is pollution. We don't want to do unnecessary labor. So anyway, nitrogen fixers are really crucial in a permaculture guild. So you can have some pretty flowers. You can have some lupins and California California lupins here. What's um, another nitrogen fix? Uh, I know um, fava beans, right? Yeah, yeah, so anything in the pea or bean family would be something just for the simple um, 
first time gardener to start with. And then as you get more into it, you can um, branch out into some of the other perennials, but that gets more into it. So, you know, like um, here in California, um, snowberry or coffee berry are native shrubs. Some of them shade tolerant, some less, or red bud. These are some native shrubs. So it depends on where you live. So I wouldn't plant a coffee berry if I was in Michigan because it's not native there and it doesn't make so much sense. But you're going to need to check in with some master gardeners or local permaculture people to see what are the best species for you. Permaculture is not a one-size-fits-all. Because Bill Molson is growing Lusania, then you know maybe you can grow it because you're in Santa Barbara here. You could, but um, if you're in Minnesota, you're not going to be growing his Tasmanian plant. So you got to do your local research. Unless you use a lot of <laughs> greenhouses. Input, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not a one size fits all. But anyway, so back to the uh, nitrogen fixers. That's the essential thing um, element to start with. And then there's a, a couple other supporters um, is how we framed it in, in the permaculture book here. Mulch plants are the next category. And so you, you brought up comfrey and um, comfrey crosses many boundaries. It's not just a mulch plant, but um, it, it's the greatest mulch plant to teach about because um, it has a you know good sized taproot and it, it's a herbaceous perennial that you can cut back in central California easily 12 times in a season. So maybe in Minnesota, you're not going to get it that quick, but uh, they have some pretty fast um, growing summers. So maybe you still can get 12 cuts in a year. But So basically you're chopping down the mulch plant as um, frequently as you can, as it grows back to a full size, then you can cut it again. So you're starting to build on-site fertility with the mulch plant. So you're starting to have as much on uh, yeah, on-site fertility, but um, on-site mulch material with the mulch plant. And so they're covering the soil and you're, you're getting it on-site. So one thing I like to think about with our Merritt Garden, um, we have an acre student farm and we have planted lots of comfrey around all the fruit trees. And so we're able to, when we're building a compost pile, a big windrow pile, for instance, we're able to get many wheelbarrows full or building a new, a new vegetable bed, we're able to get like six or more wheelbarrow full full um, loads of the comfrey leaves and then lay that down and then put horse manure over that and put finished compost over that. So we're, we're starting to do some um, on-site generation. And so for a small, so you don't have an acre, you're talking about a, a, a guild, so you can take that comfrey and just lay it down around the fruit tree and put some straw mulch over it. You don't want to just leave it on the surface or the nitrogen, the green good stuff in the comfrey will just go mostly to the atmosphere. But So you can just start generating your own uh, material on site so you don't have to um, have as many import. Mm -hmm. uh, and as many inputs and imports is what we're trying to do. And that really would save you money. Yeah, yeah. So um, the great thing about comfrey, and um, I hear you have a whole show on that, which is awesome because it's a, a strong permaculture plant. But with comfrey, you can um, chop the leaves and say you're trying to grow a tomato plant or something that's a, a heavy feeder, so to say, something that takes a lot of nutrients up. Um, you can take the comfrey leaves, put it in a, in a bucket for a, a week or less, um, ferment it, and then put it put that liquid tea, that compost tea, on that plant. And it's basically you're going to Home Depot and buying Miracle Grow, right? It's just in your garden, so you don't have to buy it. So it's it's a really good thing. So there's the central element. There's the nitrogen fixer. There's the mulch plant. Um, there's a nutrient accumulator level in the in this book. Timber Press um, simplified the permaculture language into a nutrient catcher because we are with this book we are trying to make it more accessible. Um, so for the nutrient catcher, a nutrient accumulator, they even call it a dynamic nu nutrient accumulator in the permaculture books. That is a plant that has usually a deep tap root, but it could be something like yarrow. But generally, you think about dandelion would be like an emblematic nutrient catcher because um, it has a deep single tap root it has leaves that you can cut and do the same thing add it to your compost pile or put it into a compost tea or just have it as on-site mulch and dandelion greens are very healthy for you so it's like for us too but the idea of a guild is we have a community of plants and so all the plants have a, a role in them and so it doesn't have to be these ones i'm mentioning but any plant that uses that same idea of a deep taproot and pulling up nutrients so for the other plants. Like mining the soil almost. It is, yeah. it is, yeah. It's, it's sustainably <laughs> mining it because it's, <laughs> um, it's a plant doing it. Um, so it's, it's accumulating the, the right stuff for the other things in the guild. So the nutrient catcher is the next, is the third layer. Um, and then the insectary plants in this, so the insectary, the insectary plants are kind of inviting the home scale permaculture gardener to grow flowers. Um, so that's nice, but it's it's specific flowers. So it's not so much growing a marguerite daisy because that is a pretty kind of highway landscaping kind of plant or oleander. Those are I wouldn't really invite those into my little small guild because they're not going to bring in the right 
pollinators and the right predatory insects. So there's three main families briefly, the mustard family, the carrot family, and the aster family. And so when you get into botany, and I, I did not study botany in college, I studied social movements, so, but I've learned about some of this stuff by trial and error and reading books and whatnot. But anyway, the aster family has 19,000 different species in it, so that gives you a lot of play. So that's kind of one of these things, but we're in permaculture with the food forests and with the fruit tree guilds, what we're doing is we're trying to outline a few ideas and there's tens of thousands if not millions of combinations that you can do to find a plant that's going to bring in beneficial insects so we're, we're asking um, for the aster family you can plant artichokes you can plant lettuce you can plant artichokes lettuce sunflowers um, it just goes on but th those kind of you know sunchokes these kind of things some of them are edible crops echinacea purpurea those are all asters and you don't know it as a gardener because an aster, uh, an echinacea flower looks quite different than a sunflower that looks quite different than a lettuce and an artichoke flower, but those are all cousins and those are all some of the best um, plants to put in your guild because they're going to bring in predatory insects that are going to munch on your aphids and white flies and scale and whatever the pesty insects you have. Which um, I wonder what's better for you and the environment to spray bug spray on your plants <laughs> or to use flowers. Well, we want to try to use flowers because then the flowers can be medicinal for us or just for making a bouquet and cheering us up. You know, there's that that's a good thing too. Um, but yeah, we're trying to reweave an ecological um, web, an ecosystem. So, you know, and there's other flowers, uh, other plants to put in, like a, a kale or a collard or cauliflower, um, cabbage, all those, all those brassica or mustard. Uh, those are in the mustard family. Let some of those go to seed. And this does connect into seed saving later. But the, the insects love those kind of flowers. The mustard flowers are really great for bringing the parasitoids, um, the parasitic wasp and hoverflies and things like that. So they'll, they'll um, do your, your bug control for you. So work is pollution. So if we can plant it and the bugs do it for us, the bugs eat bugs, that's, that's what happens in nature. We don't spray chemicals in nature to kill the bugs. You know, that's, that's us humans thinking we're God or something, or gods or goddesses, however you want to frame it. So we want to make as less work as we can for us. So um, mustard family and then the carrot family. And so here's another one, grow carrots. So I encourage you to grow carrots. Like it's healthy for you, right? We love carrots, but let some of them go to seed and you'll see you have a six foot tall flowering plant. It looks nothing like the carrot you pull out of the ground if you're a gardener. And there'll be so many parasitoids hovering around it. It's just an insect highway um, when you have carrots, parsley, um, parsnip, dill, those kind of things. Those are just, they're beautiful, but um, sometimes you have to let things go to full circle, full cycle in, a, in the plant world. So come to fruition. So most gardeners, most traditional gardeners see a, some aspects of some of the permaculture gardening as messy but um, you have to work harder if you're keeping a clean garden. <laughs> yeah, and what's messy, really, if you think about it? Yeah. I think it's messier to be using a lot of toxins. Mm -hmm. So I could go on about well, the gills, I love but that's, that that's idea. enough. Yeah. And, and so you, I can just imagine the big carrot flower head. Yeah. Like, it's almost like an airport for beneficial There you go. <laughs> there you go. It's great. Um, do gills happen naturally in nature? Uh, yeah, we're certainly accelerating them in our gardens. But um, we go out to nature and permaculture, we say that there's a zonation system in our garden and zone five is wilderness and um, like a intact native forest is the university is what some permaculture folks have said so that's where we go to learn the models of what's working and what the relationships are for the overstory understory ground cover I'll, I'll get into that in a second with the um, food forest but yes that's where we go for our inspiration um, and we try to model our so go on lots of hikes that's a great thing as a permaculturist to see what's working in nature where you are and so maybe there's not a forest where you are because some of us live in the great plains and maybe there's more prairie ecosystems there or maybe you're in the tundra or something so you have to figure out what you see that's growing well there so don't just plant a bunch of trees in the tundra because there's no trees there right so there's a reason you, you look to nature for the inspiration and, and grow what you see um, that is working where you are and do you think, and then we'll get to our food forest question, that this type of gardening, because um, some people do say, oh, permaculture, it's a little off putting that, that term. Yeah. Could it be called ecological gardening? Uh, for sure, yeah. So let's talk about food forests. And tell us, um, is a food forest something where you need an acre of land, lots of time, and be an arborist? What can you have a food? <laughs> can you? Because some people just think it's this massive, giant thing. Uh, 
Yeah, I just had the good fortune to go up to Seattle recently and look at the Beacon Food Forest. It's getting international press as a seven-acre food forest, and it's community-based, and it's wonderful. And they just started planting it in October, so it's quite funny that there's little sticks of trees, and so it's not seven acres yet. And they're also doing the smart permaculture principle of starting small, so they've fenced off two acres with chain-link fence and are sheep mulching and swaling it and starting their guild systems and building sheds and community garden plots and whatever. So they're, they're really... Um, getting it developed, and then they are going to expand into a seven-acre community food forest. So I think that's the future for every community to have some um, basically commons, um, edible commons. So I think that's wonderful. So yes, that's the kind of vision of food forest is big um, and bigger. Um, so that's that's a good thing. And um, you know they had thousands of volunteers to make it happen. So it's not like somebody's profit-driven thing. But anyway, for your own garden, um, yes, I think in a relatively small area you can start mimicking those things. And you know in permaculture it's all about scale. So um, I, as an urban uh, teacher, permaculture teacher, I certainly get students that say they have no land. So permaculture, you could think about different scales. So if I have um, just a 15-gallon pot, I, um, in my slideshow, I, I show this fun thing where there's a fruit tree in a 15-gallon pot that someone grew from seed and gave it to me um, from Merit. And then um, just in my nursery, I had um, white Dutch clover come in as a weed. So I've got a nitrogen fixer at the base and then wild arugula also seeded in. So it's not a full food forest, but just showing you that you can think outside the box and even on a balcony you could have low plants you could have ground covers you could have root layers you could have shrub layers you could have herb layers you could have small tree you can't really have a tall tree in a container garden but you know you can have a tomato plant as a tall tree layer kind of you thing so you, like you can be more version. you can be more you can be more good no i think it's flexible so yeah um so just using a food forest model could even be done in a couple of pots um but and, i think it's bigger is better <laughs> and so the layers then how many layers are there let's see eight main layers right uh -huh. so if you could just say a couple sentences about each one so people get an idea of what these layers uh -huh. are oh, okay um, yeah, so you could think of um, the food forest as a layered effect, and um, we're kind of trying to build a sun trap would be one way to think about it. To the south, you want a ground cover, very low stuff, or some of your smaller vegetables, and then to the north of the garden uh, is where you have your tall trees. So we're trying to have a forest ecosystem that we're trying to model on into our garden. So it's a basically, to boil it down, there's an overstory and there's an understory. That's the massive simplification of it. But to make it a little more complicated, there's a tall tree layer, so the canopy, the kind of climax species trees. Um, so these could be um, an apple tree on standard rootstock, so something quite big, 40 or 50 feet tall. So again, that's not for every property, um, but that would be the, you know, the biggest thing. So it could be walnuts, or it could be um, avocados, or, you know, just something that's quite big. Um, could be full-size fig trees, whatever the tree, but something big to the north. To the south of that, you're going to um, descend a layer to the small tree layer. So here, um, depending, it could be a semi-dwarf peach tree, or it could be a, a dwarf apple tree, depending on the rootstock, or how you prune it is, is a nice thing to think about. So with an apple tree, you could have a standard um, apple tree, so that just means the, the rootstock, is it dwarfing or not? So standard is the old-fashioned ones where they can grow quite tall, and you could take a tree like that, and um, after uh, fruiting, you cut the tree back, and then that is a summer pruning that forces the tree to be smaller. So that's a way to integrate the small tree layer um, very well. So uh, then descending down is the shrub layer, so raspberries or blueberries or even tomatoes, um, something that's quite large, potentially, or if you have a small garden, it could be a, you know, there's dwarf varieties of all these plants. So the shrub layer would be the third layer down to maximize any sunlight coming in. And you're not planting a food forest in a static point where there's all trees or all things planted right underneath each other. You're going outwards because um, it is a forest. Um, things don't grow all on top of each other. They need some space. You need to open up light canopies. So you mentioned an arborist earlier. So yes, with the tall tree, you might need to uh, thin some branches if it's shading some of the other things you want too much. So there's some involvement, but the branches can get turned into common compost or into trellises or into charcoal or whatever it's going to get used and then the next layer down would be the herb layer and here in permaculture we're thinking about herbs herbs in the ecological sense of any vegetable that's small or our nitrogen fixers or our 
nutrient accumulators, but so it's just a wide open field. There's tens of thousands of vegetables out there in the world, so of varieties and, and some pick, species. pick ones you like to eat. Pick, Don't exactly. be like me when I first started gardening and plant like a hundred radishes. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. planted a whole seed pack of eggplant. Right, I'm, right. I ate a lot of baba ganoush. <laughs> right, right. And, and there's that thing too, that's a great point you bring up that just because it's edible doesn't mean you like to eat it. And so in permaculture, a lot of us are experimenting with new perennial vegetables and new varieties. And, you know, if you don't like it just because it's edible doesn't mean you have to keep it you can dig it up and give it away or you can even compost it you know if, if it's not working if it's not ending up in your salad or in your stir fry or whatever it's like there's a reason for it you don't like it edible is not tasty it's not delectable and that's cultural and that's also individual and unique so definitely plant what you like in small batches so you don't have a hundred radishes <laughs> so yeah so there's the herb layer um, next layer down and those are also herbaceous plants is is kind of getting i was starting to refer to that in the ecological sense so plants that die back in the winter because a shrub is kind of usually has more of a woody plant material more of a structure to it like a pineapple sage or something that's just going to stay pineapple sage and comfrey is something that dies back in the winter so that's where it fits in the herb layer um, so it's not just culinary herbs but it could be in the herb layer there could be oregano and thyme and uh, 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 ground cover rosemary and you know a shrub the upright tuscany blue would be a, a shrub but it's a rosemary so it's confusing that it's an herb so it can fit at different levels depending how big is the plant what is it going to do um, in your food forest um, the next layer down would be the root layer pictured in our little book here is um, a, a parsnip so that's an obvious one so parsnip or carrots or daikon and um, one of our inspirations in permaculture is this uh, Japanese farmer Masanobu Fukuoka, the author of One Straw Revolution, and he uses a lot of, he's passed on, but in his systems he used a lot of daikon to do the tilling for us. So it's a very big taproot. It can be easily two to three feet deep in a well-tilled system, but in a permaculture garden you might use it for the tilling. So the first year it might only be four or six inches, and then the next year it would open up passages into the soil, and then it could be eight or ten, and so on. So eventually you can have the um, daikon do the work for you. So we want to go downward is the idea with the root layer um, in our systems. Um, and of course, you know, potatoes and all kinds of things and anything that's a root. Um, but we want to go up and down, like just like a, a native forest ecosystem. Then the next layer down would be the ground cover layer. So that's the lowest layer in the food forest all to the south. So you're not going to shade out anything. So in, in our raised beds, one thing we do at Merritt um, on our hillside, we don't have too many raised beds, but when we're doing annual beds and demonstrating to students, usually to the south, we put a border of strawberries in because they're the lowest thing, you, one of the lowest crops you can grow. And then there might be chard or broccoli or whatever crop in between. And then in the back of the bed to the north of the bed could be the um, cucumbers or runner beans, scarlet runner beans, or tomatoes, something that's really massive. So you're you're demonstrating the low, medium, and high. So we're maximizing space and efficiency. And um, so it's the same idea with the food forest that we want a, a edible ground cover. And it could be, you know, it could be a manzanita that makes edible berries, edible fruits, I should say. Uh, the ground cover could be a squash plant too. So anything that's going to cover the soil and do the mulching, um, and keep the moisture in and be edible and, and attractive. And, and food forests, we like the perennials as much as we can, but um, I like to mix annuals and, and um, perennials as much as I can. to. Because the know. annuals are sometimes so tasty. They're so tasty and they're so fast. So in a beginning garden, uh, we grow lots of annuals. In a more mature food forest, there's not as many. But to the south, there's always space in, in my food forest for the vegetables because you do have to have some annuals, I think. And then the next layer is the vine layer. And that's a tricky one because the concepts and the theory is that you can plant a, a vine under a tree and a lot of trees can get strangled out by graves. So it it needs to be the right tree. And today I just saw a really great example of a large mulberry tree with two grape plants and a fig all in the same space. So it was like the fig was the low plant. Even though figs get big, the mulberry had just grown so big. And the landscaper, the gardener, had planted an ornamental sycamore or a native sycamore. Um, and that got choked out by the um, mulberry. But anyway, so the mulberry was a tall tree layer. The grape was climbing up it very successfully with a large amount of grapes on it. So it, it can work. But if you put a little dwarf um, apple tree with that grape, the grape will strangle it. So it's a bit tricky. And so for a first-time gardener, I'd, I'd suggest the vine layer being on a separate trellis so you can manage the grape better or the kiwi or the beans or the cucumbers or the peas, whatever it is. Because, yeah, we are trying to have a polycultural garden, but 
uh, my mother, uh, Vicki Wellman, used to say that some plants were imperialists because they took over <laughs> just from the political family. Like, you know, tomatoes could just like take over the whole bed and then nothing else can grow. And so we do have to do some refereeing as a gardener. You know, you have to take out the things that are choking out everything else if you want to get more than just grapes. Um, then the eighth layer in the food forest is the mushroom layer. And one of my students, Teresa Halula, came up with this one. As a, as she's a mycologist. Just said, hey, you know, mushrooms are missing in this seven-layered food forest because that's the traditional permaculture standard is a seven-layer one. And so we threw in an eighth layer. Um, and you can keep going more layers. But the fungi or the mushroom layer is a really great layer in a food forest because it can grow under that tall tree layer or any of the plants um, because it doesn't need any light. And so you can grow shiitake mushrooms or oyster mushrooms in inoculated dowel, uh, inoculated logs or in sawdust logs, um, sawdust bags, whatever. So um, they don't need light. They provide nutritious food. Um, they decay the high organic matter that we're using for mulch and provide food for the other plants. So mushrooms are really great and they're, they're tasty. <laughs> and so medicinal for us. Yeah. And there's a great diagram on page 48 of your book. <laughs> and if people want to get your book, how can they find it? Um, they can find it through my own website, wildheartgardens.com, or from a local bookstore or Timber Press, the publisher. Christopher, in uh, permaculture, there are 12 principles of permaculture. And could you tell us a bit about what those 12 principles are and then share a few of your favorites? Mm -hmm. Permaculture is this design strategy around coming up with a sustainable ecosystem, um, how humans can be uh, much more sustainable in their world and their ecology and improving the diversity and um, not just gardening for people but for wildlife. So there's you know earth care, people care, fair share, our, our ethics um, that drive it, that make it separate. So you know in permaculture, hopefully it'll never get taken to Walmart as selling it or whatever. Because you know organic gardening, people tried so hard in the 70s and whatnot, and then it's gotten so co-opted. Big industrial organic farming, you know, earthbound farms selling salad mix from three countries. It's grown in three countries and sent around the world, and that's organic. It's like, well, is it? <laughs> you know, so anyway, we hope that permaculture stays true uh, in the future. And uh, so, yeah, there's the ethics of permaculture, then there's the principles of permaculture. And there's been so many different uh, versions of these of these principles, but the ones that I include in the book are from David Holmgren, the co-originator of the permaculture idea with Bill Mollison. And so he's rewritten them since the 70s when they came out with their first book. And so there's been a lot of different versions. And um, so there's 12. And he has a lot of things that he says about um, Holmgren does about interacting with nature, not just not just observing it. Uh, yeah, actually, here's one like use and value diversity. So instead of just like the John Muir's of the world of trying to isolate nature and wilderness from our society, we try to bring that in to where we live. Um, so he says uh, use and value diversity. So we want to not just value it, we want to place a value on diversity of either it's cultural diversity, so multiculturalism, you know, diverse cultures, diverse economies, um, people of different economic backgrounds, so it's not just for rich people, or it's not just for middle class people, or it's not just for low income people, but we want um, everybody to come on board and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, we want to use it too. So if we just put nature on a pedestal, we're really not going to preserve it. We need to integrate it. So it's this concept of tending the wild, where if you know native cultures, native people, families would adopt oak trees and tend them and uh, burn out some of the invasive stuff that would come up and really manage the ecosystems. The Native Americans did lots of burning, so controlled really burning. So really interacting with the ecosystem, not... Yeah, managing yeah. it for mm -hmm. our human gains. It is it's kind of selfish, but the nature benefits from it as well by having all these native plants that we're integrating and, you know, it's very polycultural. So we want to use and value diversity and it's um, it's an interesting thing. And so we could think about in a more modern agricultural sense, the Irish potato potato famine. So there's a very good example of monoculture to the maximum. In, in, in Ireland in the 1840s, they just have one variety of potato that they're growing. Very poor people are growing it, and it's quickly in a couple of generations or less, maybe 25 or 30 years, it's replaced their um, prior crops from the you know, European colonists bringing back these things from the so-called New World, um, and they just brought back one variety, and they planted it on a massive scale, and then they had a, a phytophthora, they had a, a blight that wiped it out, and, uh, you know, it's 
everything's political. So during the Irish potato famine, they're exporting millions of pounds of food to England because they're a colony. And so they're still exporting oats and barley and whatever they were growing during this time. And so what we want to look to for a diversity model is where the people were growing it originally in the Andes um, during the Incan Empire. Um, and still today, there's 5,000 varieties of potatoes grown on different elevations, different soil types, different water requirements. So you're never going to have a Irish potato famine of that proportion in the Andes when you have 5,000 varieties. And that's kind of the diversity that we need to go back to so we, so we have a sustainable agricultural oh, system. You don't have total collapse if something happens. Yeah. Yeah, so using value diversity. And so it's not just putting it up on a pedestal. It's, it's actually cultivating it and tending the wild, so to say, you know, collecting those acorns. Because if we just look at the the oak trees and go, here's a preserve, nobody stays in them. And John Muir, I mean, I do have a political bent. He didn't talk about Native American people. He excluded them. And it's like, hey, they were land managers for tens of thousands of years in the Yosemite Valley that he was glorifying. And I'm glad he did and talked about the web of life and all this great stuff. And he's an important ecologist. But... You know, he, he forgot them. the native people out. And it's like um, people are in the environment and, you know, uh, we change it and we can't just have the environment separate from us. We are the environment. We're part of Gaia. Right. So we have to start. Um, I thought we were separate up. and better, Christopher. Oh, no. <laughs> That's the idea. That's the idea. But we got to grow up as a species. <laughs> it's time. Instead of just growing outward mm-hmm. and through our sprawl. <laughs> yeah, we got to mature for sure. So then uh, another observation, uh, another principle I wanted to share with you was uh, observe and interact. So it's kind of a foundational permaculture thing. And um, it's kind of a funny thing how it came about. But reading the permaculture um, classic books like the designer's manual, they, they reference um, observing a site for a whole year before you do anything. And as an urban person, as a younger person, uh, that was an impossible task for me to do. And you know, renting a place and then moving on, um, I couldn't just observe a backyard urban lot for a year before I did anything. So it was like, I don't understand. What is he talking about? But anyway, I um, happened to have a situation where I've been doing gardening for 20 years, starting many gardens. But I, um, my present site where I've been for the last six and a half years, I actually got to observe the place for a year before moving in. Because the quick story is um, I now am married with kids. Um, but uh, seven years ago, I was just starting to date my future to be wife. I didn't know it at the time, but you know, so I'm just dating her, living somewhere else. I wasn't really doing anything in my girlfriend's garden. Um, and so I got to just look at it for a whole year. So I saw where was the garden flooding. So you'd asked earlier about sectors and stuff. So, oh, seriously, the, the lawn, the central part of the garden, that's where the floods happen during the winter. So interesting. And, you know, all these ornamental shade trees and where's the light? Like, where would I put a garden? And um, it's a 3,000 square foot backyard garden. So it's 40 feet by 75 feet. And they had put the vegetable garden literally about 70 feet away from the house. It was all the way in the back corner. Uh, three small vegetable beds. And so the first problem with that, doing some observation, was that there was an apartment building, two-story apartment building to the south of the property. The neighboring, the neighboring property was, was blocking the sun in the winter time. So in California, we can grow 12 months of the year. So I quickly observed that they had a six-month garden in California. Like, huh, this is weird. And then the second thing is that permaculture is about good common sense. And um, having the vegetable garden so far away might look good in a design manual Um, for conventional ag landscape kind of stuff, landscape design, but it was too far away. So it becomes not convenient for us, so we're not going to use it. Bill Molson talks about designing in for our own laziness, so to say he doesn't want to get his slippers wet trying to harvest his, I don't have the exact quote, but to make his morning omelet, he doesn't want to get his, his slippers wet. You have to design with you and yourself in mind and your habits mm-hmm. and what you're, would you be willing to walk? And if you're not, which mm-hmm. most of us have after work, right. it's like, oh, I don't want to yeah. go. And another thing we say in permaculture is it's about intelligent design. So that they just had a bad design, but it was conventional. Actually, in one of my textbooks that I got from taking a, a landscape horticulture class in 1999, there's literally a picture of a vegetable garden in the back. This was a book written in Ohio, far back of the yard, a, a ornamental flower border, and then a large lawn. And then there's the house. And it's like, that makes no sense. Um, and this is exactly what we inherited in, in the yard, where a big green lawn, ornamental shade trees, flower border separating the unsightly vegetable garden raised beds in the far back. And so as soon as I moved in a year later doing all this observation of what ornamental trees are we going to cut down and I even did some controversial things with my wife where I cut down a a young redwood tree because it was to the south and it's like I've been in enough gardens here's a 20-foot redwood tree it's young 
it took us, you know, two minutes to cut it down. It's sad because, you know, back in the day I was a headwaters activist and defending redwoods, but so we cut it down. I didn't ask her. I got in trouble, but um, we planted 16 fruit trees and nitrogen fixing trees and it's beautiful and whatever. And so you have the, sun. And we have yeah. sun and a redwood tree sucks all the water. I've, so anyway, so there's all these mistakes they made. Um, so we integrated some of their mistakes, like the echinacea flower border went to our herb garden much closer to the house and the vegetable garden went all over the garden. And I don't just have a few vegetables that are kind of all throughout the whole garden and we sheet mulch the whole garden and built um, raised beds out of the ornamental trees and then those logs rot out and make beautiful soil and they grow mushrooms and so there's all these layers to a permaculture garden that just keeps going but anyway and all, if, if all that was about want to see your garden they mm-hmm. can see you have videos on your website yeah wildheartgardens.com so all that was about observe and interact so it's you're doing the observation but you are a, a player in your own ecosystem I think your book has a great discussion of the principles of permaculture, if people are interested in that. Mm -hmm. We'll end with, I wanted to ask you a bit about Merritt College and maybe tell people about the program and then how you kind of got it off the ground and if you have any advice for people who would like to get permaculture in their community college. So three times a year, there's a permaculture design certificate class um, at the campus. And so each semester, there's at least 25 that kind of come through, sometimes more. It's um, for uh, middle class and middle aged and working class and young people. I've had students as young as 16, one student as old as 82. Yeah, so I have diverse ethnic groups, um, diverse ec- economic groups taking the class because it's quite affordable. It's, it's only a polyculture. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. And it's what the direction that permaculture needs to go is not to be just a ghetto of white people of more well-heeled economic people, whatever the ghetto is. But, you know, it needs to be everybody in in the culture um, learning about it and taking it to new directions. The format is you take the class from January to May, one day a week. And so that's a really nice long format season. So you can start in the winter and end in the summer. So you you really get a, a difference. And because I was not so confident in my abilities in the beginning, I set it up so you have to take the class for two semesters to get the PDC. Because like, oh, you really have to do a lot to get a PDC. And so it's technically 180 hours of classroom time to get our PDC, and it's under $300. Um, So it's really good. A PDC is kind of different each time. It sounds like a really good way to immerse yourself in the learning. Yeah. So the last thing about Merit that I wanted to say is that we have um, a 17 and a half unit PDC through the department because uh, academic language is quite different. So, you know, the PDC existed before as just a 72 hour course that Bill Molson came up with based on his books. So there's that piece, and, you know, you, you can't really teach horticulture in 72 hours. So that's why I thought we need to do something more. But anyway, just even my six unit PDC isn't recognized by the state of California. And so ours now is recognized by the state because we made it a 17 and a half unit basic certificate. And so that's called a permaculture design certificate. And so it sends different bells and whistles in the academic circles. But basically, they have to take um, LH1, um, a basic horticulture class, plant terminology, and then take the um, permaculture class LH twenty eight um, A and B and um, that's not seventeen units yet and then there's some electives so they could take the mushroom class or they could take an agroecology class or take a, an insect class or you know there's different classes where they, they electively can choose to make up the seventeen and a half units and we're starting to get quite a few people that are getting the PDCs through the st- certified by the state of California and then the dream and eventually when I get some grant support or whatever it's going to be is that we're set up to do an AA in permaculture there and I think we need a whole permaculture department. Department. So eventually we'll get an AA and have our own department. But for now, we're hosted in the Landscape Hort Department. We're very grateful because they tolerate us and we have a big presence. We, you know, we're the one class that does a lot um, so oh, great. much. Now, if people listening had questions about how to start this in their own community college, could they contact you at your website? Yeah, yeah. And then Merit is a community college, so we have open hours. You can just come and check it out and you can go to MeritLandHort.com. I know in your book that you mentioned that the part of permaculture that you really, um, one of your favorite parts is sharing the bounty of your harvest. Mm -hmm. And do you have anything you'd like to share with the larger worldwide community that's listening to the podcast right now? Um, Yeah, two, two ideas that we've, two ideas that we've done that really are emblematic of the permaculture um, idea and ideals of abundance are a a seed library. So I've been involved with that. I'm 
lucky enough to have been one of the founders of the Bay Area Seed Interchange Library, Basil. Um, and I think this is something that other people can really start. Uh, and this is included in the book. Rebecca Newburn, one of my students, took the class at Merritt, and she's a middle school science teacher and very organized. So she apprenticed with us at Basil. Like, how do you do it? It's grassroots, no money. And then... Um, she took that idea to the Richmond Public Library, and so now the seed library is there. She put she launched a website, uh, richmondgrowsseeds.org, and now since she launched that website, she's been on Oprah Magazine or whatever it's called, and uh, Martha Stewart Living and Organic Gardening, and so she's just gotten great publicity because she's fantastic, and she's got the seed public seed library in um, English, Spanish, and Mandarin, translated these little three-minute videos on how to do seed saving and how should you use the seed library. And because she did that, the librarian at Richmond sent it out to the librarian network, and now seed libraries are in 30 states and counting. It's just, and, and last, when I wrote the book, it was in 17 states. And so it's just like that was two years, or two years ago when I turned in the manuscript, and Rebecca likes to say that the uh, seed library network movement has gone fungal. So we don't want to think it's gone viral. In permaculture, we want to change the language to something sustainable so we want to think about those mycelial networks and the hyphae and all that stuff and so you know if you have a kale plant or a collard plant you can have 10,000 seeds from one plant so that's where the abundance comes from it goes off from the world and so yeah hopefully um, let a thousand seed libraries bloom from anybody hearing this right because it's, it's just it's time has come we've been saving seeds for 12,000 years we, we got to take it back from the Monsantos and the pioneers and whatever the big seed companies seed chemical conglomerates kind of stuff and so that's you know to tie it in that's my anti-gmo anti-Monsanto activism is bring people together to grow seeds together um, so anyway that's seed saving and seed libraries and then another brief thing is um, crop swaps so say you're getting together for a weekly crop swap during the peak of abundance when you have too many tomatoes or too many plums or too many lemons or whatever the crop is, too many chayote for me, um, and uh, you want to share it, too many tree tomatoes, whatever it is. So you bring that one crop that you feel like in your own home garden, I've got too many zucchinis, I'm, I'm going to take them to this weekly crop swap, and there's big long card tables, everybody dumps or gently places all their, <laughs> their produce. People even bring honey to these swaps, you know, bundled herbs and whatever. So, so I think this is a great thing for anybody on any scale. It could be rural, urban, or suburban for this kind of crop swap idea. And so you grow what you grow well, and then you share it with other people. That's kind of how we need to go back to a barter network and sharing your surplus. And that's one of these permaculture ideas, but it's really literally a crop swap is sharing your surplus. So you don't have to worry about growing everything yourself. Permaculture is not about self-sufficiency where there's a wall and I have a gun and all that kind of stuff. It's about self-reliance. <laughs> Get so off my property. Community <laughs> self-reliance would be my last thing. And, but anyway, I think you're but heading off swap. to the Santa Barbara City College um, <laughs> food forest. So thank you so much, Christopher. This has been great to talk with you. And I hope the rest of your book tour goes really well. Good. Thank you so much. And we'll be in touch. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.